Now I'd like to welcome to the show Ashley Baker, Director of Public Policy at the Committee for Justice. Welcome to Free the Economy, Ashley. Thank you for having me. Okay, now it's time to get litigious. So the Supreme Court's last term just ended a few months ago, and the final decisions from last year were uh, announced at the end of June. Uh, but people are already looking forward to the new 2023-2024 Supreme Court term. Uh, and uh, those cases are going to be argued starting in uh, October. Uh, so we're going to dive into some of those top cases that we're looking ahead to. Uh, but first, could you give us sort of a micro overview of the last session? Because uh, right, the in, in my mind, the big cases that stand out are uh, uh, Harvard and UNC Affirmative Action, Biden administration student loan, uh, the same-sex wedding website case in Colorado, and then I guess Sackett versus EPA, which was about like water regulations. Uh, is there any kind of like, first of all, from your end, is there any super big thing about uh, last term that you think is really important to focus on? Or is there an overall trend in the decisions and the majorities we saw? Sure, I would say one uh, major trend, and this is a, one of several major trends, but also one of several major trends that are kind of in, in line with the cases from this term that I'm about to talk to about, or at least in line with the courts having granted those cases, is the court, the Roberts court taking a bite at the administrative state and um, taking a closer look at the constitutional separation of powers. And that's one thing that all the cases that you went into, for the most part, um, really had in common. Two, two of the cases you mentioned, for example, Biden v. Nebraska, that's, uh, that was one of the major cases of, of the past term, obviously, and kind of in theme with your podcast and the economic theme in terms of, you know, law and economics as well, that was really significant because they predicted that the economic and political significance of Biden's student debt cancellation was somewhere between 469 and 519 billion. Um, so talk about, as Justice Lee would say, hiding elephants in mouse holes, which, you know, isn't exactly quite the correct analogy here, given that, um, given that it was done through executive order, but certainly was not authorized by Congress. So you, so you have the Roberts Court kind of looking at the separation of powers issue and, you know, how much agencies can be delegated, how, you know, what the scope of their authority is, and also, you know, how explicit Congress needs to be in delegating or not delegating that authority. And if the, the silent, if the statute is silent, then you know, the agency doesn't necessarily have power to act there. And I think the court has reaffirmed that time after time over the past two terms. Yeah, it's interesting that uh, I think people who are not like uh, attorneys, legal theorists, pundits, you know, court watchers, uh, sometimes don't get the the difference between the sort of instant details of a case and then sort of like the bigger implications of it. So if they see a case like, well, is it about, it's about uh, say, you know, student loans, uh, it's not always the court deciding whether canceling student loans is a good idea or a bad idea. The question is whether, like in this case, the president has the authority to do something like this via an executive order versus having Congress authorize it. So it's really not in, I think a lot of people get hung up on the, like the, the specific details, of a lot of these cases um, and, and, and don't think quite as much about, well, the real question the court is deciding is what is government supposed to do? What is, what are various parts of the government allowed to do? And that could actually be completely different from what any of them think is the virtues of the, the specific policy itself. Yeah, that's absolutely correct. And that's kind of how that's what drives public opinion, especially at the time that these cases are released. And you see a lot of, I would say, pretty hyperbolic headlines. And, and that's always the case every term. It's been more increasingly the case in, in recent years now that they're is a conservative majority but you know we have people looking at the policy and it's not exactly it's not the job of a judge or justice to make that policy um it's them to you know call the balls and strikes when it comes to what the law is and what the statute says so a lot of these are really at the end of the day more of a matter of that's uh, of statutory interpretation or you know, whether or not it's constitutional for the administration to do what they are doing and in a lot of cases recently they have ruled no it's not um and and that's regardless of who is in the White House, too, by the way. This isn't something that just these principles don't apply to just the Biden administration. They apply to any administration. Right. 
Now, as far as new cases coming up, we have uh, a, a case called Loper Bright Enterprises versus Ramondo. So, uh, again, on the surface, that case is about a National Marine Fisheries Service regulation that requires fishermen to uh, pay the costs of observers from the government who stand on their boat and see whether they're complying with the fishing rules or not. But the deeper question here is really about uh, how much... Uh, among other things, how much deference federal courts should give to federal agencies when they decide to write their own rules. What's what's your take on Loper Bright? So Loper Bright, if anyone here has seen the movie Coda that won the Academy Award for Best Picture a couple of years ago, that is, by the way, um, the same regulation there. And it's analogous to if you're, you're driving down the highway and an agency wants you to, I mean, maybe this is a perfectly analogous, no analogy in the law is, um, wants to prevent you from speeding. You'd have to pay, you know, for the police officer or the you know, regulator to sit in your passenger seat and make sure that you're doing what you're doing. And that would um, impact your you know, day-to-day life and your financial system situation very much so. But the question that's really being considered there is this something we call the Chevron Doctrine, or specifically the case Chevron versus Natural Resource Defense Council. And it's something that's been a bit in the spotlight for the past, I would say, four or five years more publicly, I mean, more for those of us who work in administrative law, a lot longer than that. And the question that the court granted here um, in considering this case is um, whether or not Chevron should be overruled. And there's a second part of that question, too, whether or not um, if it should be overruled or if it should at least be clarified so that uh, that statute sort of silence concerning controversial powers expressly but narrowly granted elsewhere in the statutes do not constitute an ambiguity regarding deference to the agency. So under Chevron, when the statute is big, it's ambiguous, then courts have to, instead of make, coming up with their own decision through um, you know, the normal role of the courts, they have to defer to the interpretation of those agencies. So that's what's coming into question. This is a really big um, case and a really big question that the court is about to decide. So in this case, you have, uh, say, like an agency like the Environmental Protection Agency, the the original uh agency that was subject to the the, the Chevron uh, decision. Uh, the Chevron doctrine gives the agency a lot of ability to sort of define what their own power is in a way. And and this I feel like is when by a lot of people in the like conservative legal movement have said, well maybe this is this is this is not a great thing because uh, we want more responsibility to be with Congress and and we don't want the agencies to be making their own rules and then deciding when they apply. Yes, that's correct. I would point out, though, that at the time there was an element of this. So it's kind of almost, I wouldn't call it overcorrection, it's an overexpansion problem. But at the time, there was also a concern about these policies being written by courts. So there were some you know, valid concerns back, you know, at, at the time of Chevron being decided um, that were very much the opposite of the problem we have today, though, because now we have the courts who, you know, there's not much power in Article 3 here. And then you have um, this entire body of law that's been built off of Chevron over the years and went in kind of clarifies when they can, um, or, or not clarifies, but expands when agencies can interpret the scope of their own authority, how much they can interpret that, and whether or not they can also kind of, you know, ping pong back and forth and change their mind, um, as Brand X later said, um, as we saw like the net neutrality cases, for example, and um, with every administration, we get an FCC that says the opposite of what the previous FCC said, and they said, okay, well, we can defer to our own interpretation, even when it's, you know, the opposite, even when it's vague, ambiguous. So we have a lot that was kind of born of the Chevron doctrine itself. I think that's a really good point, especially about uh, Chevron, because in, if you go uh, further back among uh, in the sort of a conservative legal movement, what what conservatives uh, were were saying about uh, courts and deference and things like that uh, back in like the 60s and 70s, you know, you had conservatives complain about the imperial judiciary. You know, we shouldn't have these judge made laws. And there was a feeling that the judges, uh, that uh, federal judges were uh, like left wing activist judges and that and that that was terrible. Um, and the uh, the the EPA officials that got the deference in the original Chevron case were Ronald Reagan's appointed EPA director. Right? The original Chevron case let Reagan's EPA may, may, you know, sort of interpret their own rules. And that was a win for them when they were being sued by environmental activists from the Natural Resources Defense Council. Um, so we've we've 
in 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 a, in a huge cycle of multi decades in a way we've gone from on from the beginning with uh republican officials and conservatives saying uh judges have way too much uh authority um we should have the agencies uh have more authority uh and then in more recent years they said well no 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 the agencies now have too much authority so we need to like correct back way yes um i, I would say i mean i i think your categorization is a little bit too political almost in, in terms of you know who which um administration was was in power at the time but one thing i, I would point to though is what judges that you know when they made the chevron decision and what people didn't realize at the time too was how congress would just stop writing laws as explicitly um and just kick the can down the road to these agencies and also the entire you know body of law that would evolve after chevron um and i i think they didn't realize you know what exactly this would lead to and that's the same with you know brand x for example which justice thomas by the way who was um the original author of the brand x decision wrote in 2020 in a um a dissent from the denying of a, a the cert petition that you know maybe i was wrong here maybe we should go back and reevaluate this um because it these agencies have become a very different creature than what um, they were at the time. And a lot of that, too, is because Congress has not, you know, been explicit in, in writing laws and have you know, given a lot of power to these agencies. Yeah, I guess. I mean, I'm uh, I'm sure it's right that the the people making those decisions, the judge uh, judges writing those decisions, weren't necessarily thinking about them in uh, partisan and ideological terms themselves, but in terms of the the general opinion of ideologues looking at the court right there's been an interesting sort of shift over you know what they think is uh the correct balance on this you know uh courts versus executive agencies versus uh congress and policy making uh well let's let's go on to the next case next up securities and exchange commission versus jarcasy so the original dispute here is between the securities and exchange commission the sec and talk radio host and hedge fund manager uh george jarcasy uh, the SEC uh, accused him of uh, securities fraud and uh, adjudicated that case through one of their their in-house judges. And uh, Jarksy and his attorneys disputed that. And, and now there's a d question about whether uh, the SEC should be able to adjudicate these uh, securities cases in-house or whether they should have to go to a uh, what we call Article Three court. Yes. What's your take on that one? So, so that pretty much sums it up. Uh, and the Securities and Exchange Commission isn't the only agency that has uh, has this sort of system, has these in-house proceedings. The Federal Trade Commission does as well. But basically, the, the court, the question being considered is what you just described, but also whether or not those in-house proceedings, which you know is done within the agency, it's brought by the agency, it's in front of the administrative law judge that is um, subject to, it, it is, cannot be removed at will, um, is subject to removal protections. And also, so it's, you know, judge, jury, executioner, it's all the Securities and Exchange Commission here. So the several questions being considered is whether or not that uh, it fits is, is a violation of the Seventh Amendment when it comes to jury trial, but also whether or not the for the removability of the ALJs itself, whether or not that structure is constitutional, and whether or not all of this, if it um, if it violates the non delegation doctrine too. So that there is a three part question. There's a lot being considered here. It was a really interesting case coming out of the Fifth Circuit actually, and we have uh, a Fifth Circuit that's gotten quite um, they've taken a up quite a few cases that are administrative law related. So it, we'll see. It's interesting. This also comes on the back of Axon versus FTC last year. And in that opinion, that was a, it was a, well, there are two cases that were considered in parallel, one involving the Federal Trade Commission, one involving the SEC, um, Axon versus FTC, which was consolidated with the other SEC case, essentially said that you have to, if you, if a company has a, or someone who is subject to these enforcement proceedings, if they have a collateral constitutional claim, such as the ones that Jarkazi is making, such as saying that this entire process is unconstitutional, this is a violation of my rights, they don't have to 
exhaust that in-house procedure before going to federal court. Because by the time they, it's a huge violation of due process and that by the time they get out of that administrative proceeding, which if they do, because a lot of uh, those who are subject to these enforcement proceedings, they settle or some companies go bankrupt, they usually don't necessarily make it to the end of these proceedings. Um, so they shouldn't have to wait until then if they have constitutional concerns. So we had that last term and we have Jarkezi this term. Uh, there are you know, three questions being considered, so we'll see exactly where the court decides to go with this. I think that would be interesting. And we have two justices particularly who have written a, a good bit about removability and um, we have Chief Justice Roberts and also Kavanaugh who have written in lower courts about this. So we'll have to see. This is a really interesting case, though. Well, yeah, and I, when, when cases like this come up, I feel like uh, a lot of uh, regular people will, will will sort of tune out to it, thinking like, "Well, what does this what does this have to do with me? I don't I don't run a hedge fund, uh, right? I'm not uh, you know I'm not worried about." Anything I do in my daily life being subject to a Securities and Exchange Commission, uh, you know, uh, enforcement action, uh, but you know, maybe not so much with the remo removability question, but with the like the right to a jury trial, the due process question. The to me anyway, uh, the question is: This is about does a federal government agency have to respect your due process rights or not? <laughs> right in my you know in my view at least, the uh, Jargacy's uh, complaint uh, and the, the the wider complaint about this is in house adjudication um, rather than re real courts and real judges. Uh, it's the government stacking the deck in its own favor, like you said, uh, functioning sort of as judge, jury, and executioner all at one. Um, and even if a person uh, looks at this and says, "Well, I'm never gonna, I'm, I don't, I'm not worried about ever encountering the SEC myself," uh, it is still in your and everyone's interest to have. A federal government which is required to observe and protect our due process rights <laughs> even if this particular case you don't think it applies to you absolutely and just because it's a lot well to go through an administrative proceeding instead of or three and other you know to make a some of an analogy here back to the FTC, you know, antitrust cases, for example, they can go through either the FTC, there's dual enforcement authority, FTC, DOJ. If it's DOJ, it goes straight to federal court. Um, if it's FTC, they have the option of doing that or not. So whether or not you get the full extent of your meaningful due process rights is really up to a coin toss there. And the SEC also has the ability to bring them in-house. And going back to kind of our, our theme about the, the constitutional separation of powers, it, this is all... All goes hand in hand too, especially with the administrative law judges not being necessarily removable except for um, for cause. Same goes with the commissioners, and that is a question that hasn't been granted by the court yet. But you see this insulation that is going on, in which these ALJs, the agencies more generally, are pretty insulated from the you know, other three branches of government, um, and that they can do this on their own. And no matter what Congress says, in, in the case of independent agencies, and a, a lot of cases, not you know, it doesn't matter really what the administration thinks uh, of those officials, um, they can still enjoy that removal protection and also enforce the law. Mm -hmm. Okay, now another one. Uh... We have uh, Community Financial Services Association of America versus the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Mm -hmm. So so in this case, uh, Consumer Financial Services Association is a trade association of uh, 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 lenders. Uh, their CFSA is challenging the CFPB, Consumer Financial Protection Bureau's rule about uh, payday loans and uh, small, small loans and, and uh, direct lending and how they can... Um, Make those loans and collect on, uh, collect them back. Um, so the trade association of the people who make payday loans challenged this rule that the CFPB put out about uh, uh, conditions. Um, but the the bigger question this time uh, is maybe even bigger than the case of the SEC case, which is just about the you know adjudication of certain enforcement proceedings. Whereas the uh, the the payday loan people are saying that the CFPB is sort of the entire structure of it is unconstitutional, that the entire agency it sort of well, shouldn't exist um, because in part because of how it's funded, this sort of eccentric way that's not common with other federal agencies. What, what do we need to know about that? Yes. So so in that case, the, the question is really whether or not it's unlike a lot of other federal agencies or most fe other federal agencies, which have to go through the congressional appropriations process, it is funded um, directly out um, 
it's funded directly out of the treasury. So it's, you know, it's an issue of whether or not that funding structure is actually constitutional. And what the implications will be, it remains to be seen. And sometimes with these cases, it, it depends on whether or not the provision that's being challenged is severable from the rest of the agency's, you know, founding statute. Um, so sometimes if it is, that means you basically, you know, Congress can either by then move the case by passing some sort of law that brings it under that umbrella, or it's only, you know, the impact is relatively limited. A in this case, though, I, I think the CFPB is making an argument, it seems that this will be massively impactful to their other agency actions, it seemed based on their last brief, um, but whether or not it will be, that you know, depends on really what the court decides here, is saying this is only one regulation uh, or one package of regulations that's being challenged, but it does call into question all of the agency's actions and that of other agencies that have similar funding structures as well. Um, but the CFPB particularly is um, kind of at risk here. And this isn't the first time the court in recent years has taken a bio of the CFPB either. They ruled in TILA law in 2020 that uh, on the removability question regarding the head of the CFPB and whether or not that person is insulated from removability and said, no, they are not. So we'll see where they go and if they continue to have headed that direction when it comes to the agency. Because there are a lot of problems with the CFPB and the way um, that the agency itself is structured in almost a way like the PCAOB, which was eventually declared unconstitutional as a whole, um, was structured as well. well yeah, and I, and I think it's interesting to sort of just talk for a second about why, why, why does it matter that this agency gets its money from point A or, or point B? Uh, you know, normally uh, all these federal agencies have uh, like you said, have to go through the congressional appropriations process, which is every year Congress writes piece of legislation that says this is how much money every agency gets and there's a lot of debate over it right often very contentious debate right and 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 that is the the political process that we expect right uh our elected representatives decide which policy priorities are uh you know get the most resources and which maybe get slightly less and that's that's what congress is there for um but but you know in the case of the CFPB uh, they just get to go to the Federal Reserve and say, well, we'd like a billion dollars for our budget, please. <laughs> right. And right. so that r removes, you know, democratic accountability, but also a certain, you know, uh, fi fiscal discipline. Right. Where where the agency can just sort of ask for as much money as it wants, where it doesn't have to to fight, as I think it should with with all the other, you know, there's a lot of things that the federal government spends money on. We spend more money than we have already. But there should be at least some balancing of priorities. And that seems like what Congress is supposed to be there for when it comes to appropriating uh, money. So it's not it's not just, you know, again, my 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 take on this is that it's not just some minor technical detail that the CFPB gets its funding different from other agencies. It's bad that it's different in this particular case for important reasons that have to do with, you know, our democracy and constitution. Yes, no, that's absolutely right. When they can go straight to the Federal Reserve and not go through the congressional pro process, that process that leads to appropriations, and I, I agree with you, there's way too much government spending. I think there should be way more debate over exactly how that money is spent, but at least you know, if you're going through the appropriations process, there is democratic accountability. There's you know two sides arguing, you know, two sides of this debate and you know, taxpayers who are paying attention in terms of how exactly government money is being spent. Um, and that's also how the separation of powers, once again, is, is supposed to work and that Congress does control the power of the purse there. And they that is the, the process that's closest to you know, the people, to a democracy, to, and that's you know, money is used to um, you know, to fund things that really impact people on a day-to-day -day basis. And when there's no accountability, when they can go straight to um, the government, to the first branch and not have to go through. So to the executive and not go through um, through the normal debate and the normal appropriations process. Now, uh, we got one more here that is uh, near and dear to our hearts at CEI, and it's Moore v. United States, uh, the case challenging the uh, the mandatory repatriation tax, which was part of the Tax Cuts and Job Act in 2017. Uh, I think a lot of a lot of people I know were uh, fairly big big fans of the Tax Cuts and Job Act in general. Uh, that's you know the the sort of Trump tax cut bill, you know, big big tax reform in 2017. Uh, but this part, what I'm sure seemed like a very tiny part at the time, uh, is is a problem. Uh, so the it has to do with 
uh, uh, overseas investments and taxing them. And uh, the problem is that it is it's in the position of taxing what we call unrealized gains, which is, you know, theoretically you invested in something and the the, the value of it went up, but you haven't, uh, you know, cashed that money out or used it for anything. And so it's not in what people would normally, what the IRS would normally call income. Uh, so it wouldn't normally be something you could tax, but in the TCJN 2017, they said, yes, it is. Uh, so uh, this is... Uh, an issue it's a constitutional issue uh about whether this kind of this kind of money is something that uh it's even it's even constitutional uh, to be subject to tax or not because of course this country unlike some others does not have a wealth tax it has to be income before it's taxed uh and uh so we don't have to spend a, a ton of time on this because we did a whole episode nine interview with my distinguished colleague jan greenberg um but uh what do you think is this do you think this is going to be big is it going to be is it is it kind of like a a, a minor technical case uh because i think it i think it could be very interesting i think it could be big i mean not just because the subject matter and all the good points you just made about how the impact of that but if we even had senator durbin calling on um calling for Chief Justice Roberts to make Alito accuse in this case and in a scheduling order that was sometime last week, we saw Justice Alito kind of right um, on the side of that saying, no way, that's not happening. Um, here are all the reasons why. Um, don't want to get too much into the recusal debate because there's there's a lot to a lot to unpack there. But uh, but we saw Senator Durbin asking Alito to recuse just because he did an interview for the Wall Street Journal with David Rifkin, who represents one of the parties in the case. And the interview had absolutely nothing to do with about the case. It had to do about the Dobbs leak and the court and um, a number of other broader topics. It had absolutely nothing to do here. So if that's any indication um, of where this might be going, it, it seems that those who like the tax like taxes the most are really nervous about it. <laughs> mm. um, so so there's that. But I do think there is a very you know, practical side of this, as you, you were pointing out, in, in terms of unrealized capital gains and the broader effect of this case. Yes. All right. Now, lots of people in uh, D.C. and uh, the legal world are are following, you know, are following these cases. But, you know, none of them are as controversial as some of the, the very biggest cases uh, from recent years, like, uh, you know, Roe versus Wade being overturned by Dobbs. You know, that was like the really big, you know, nuclear nuclear blast that everyone paid attention to, even if they don't normally care about federal courts or, or even the Supreme Court. Which one of, of these cases do you think is going to be kind of the the standout in the next term? Uh, even if even if none of them is big as as big as you know Roe and Dobbs, uh, what do you think is going to kind of like capture people's uh, attention, or is it going to, or no one's going to pay any attention till till we have decisions? What do you think? It's hard to say, and it's. Uh, at the end of the day, at you know, the end of this term, for example, uh, it's there. There are always a couple of cases that are always usually decided in that last week or so, and those are considered the more controversial ones. And this, the past term, I would say that ended up being uh, the affirmative action case, obviously, um, Harvard UNC case, and also Biden v. Nebraska, the student loan case, because that is the one that the media, the ones that the media pay the most attention to, the ones that have kind of that narrative that um, can be pushed or about more practical and less kind of esoteric issues such as um, administrative law judges and um, the separation of powers. But it's hard to say for next term. And I would point out too that there are a lot of cert petitions, there are hundreds that have not been reviewed and either granted or denied. And we'll find out more about those in the next couple of weeks because the um, what they call the loan conference, which is the one after the end of the summer, which the judge justices come back and they consider all these cert petitions that have been filed. And then the following Monday, which is on its first on Monday, the first Monday of October, um, there's there's an order list and there are lots of pending cases that the judges, sorry, the justices will be looking at on September 26th. And then the term starts again on October 2nd. So over those next couple of weeks, we'll see the orders come out in which they do grant more cases. So there might be some more controversial things related to, um, let's see, I'm just using this as an example, the Second Amendment, there are some, you know, gun rights type cases um, floating around out there. I've paid less attention to those because we haven't filed any amicus briefs as an organization in one of those cases in a number of years, or at least we haven't this term. 
So th that's always a big issue. Anything related to you know, online speech, for example, that's a big issue. But right now, the I do think Clover Bright is pretty big in what is being considered. And you, you'll see the media take that out of context and say, you know, this allows, the e this makes the EPA completely powerless. This, you know, it will lead to pollution. This You see all that in Sackett versus EPA, for example. You know, this will lead us all to be drinking lead water by next week. Um, and you see that sort of hyperbole out there. So I, I think in terms of the administrative law cases we just discussed, the obvious one would be Looper Bright. All right. So we'll, we'll be on the edges of our seat looking for uh, the beginning of October to see if the court uh, decides to take any of those yet unannounced uh, controversial uh, challenges uh, that we will, we'll, we'll, we'll definitely, I will be speculating wildly between now and then uh, to see what else get, gets picked up. But uh, until we know that, uh, we will uh, take your analysis to heart and uh, look forward to what comes next. So before we go, tell us where everyone can find you and all of your excellent analysis online. Sure, everyone can find me. Um, you can find me either via Twitter or on our website. My Twitter handle is and Ashley says. Um, my name is Ashley Baker, Director of Policy Committee for Justice, and our Committee for Justice website is committeeforjustice.org. All right. Excellent. Thanks so much. Thank you.